Hello, today we're going to deal with the question of did Paul think that Jesus was God? And we're going to focus on the passage Philippians 2, 5 through 11. People who say yes often point to this passage to show not only that uh, Paul thought that Jesus was God, but also that Paul believed in the incarnation, the view that Jesus pre-existed his earthly birth in the form of God. We're going to look at probably the biggest um, argument against the view that this passage teaches that uh, Jesus was God, and uh, that passage, that view is that Paul is actually teaching his uh, second Adam Christology. So we're going to take a look at that view and uh, see if it is convincing. All right, um, let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, first, the, the most important question is, what does Paul have to do with the historical Jesus? Why is it important whether or not Paul thought that Jesus was God? Well, first of all, it's important to remember that Paul is our earliest Christian writer, meaning that um, when, if we can figure out what Paul believed, then we have a glimpse into what the earliest Christians that we can trace believed. But second of all, uh, Paul himself says that he fact-checked his gospel message with three of the most important eyewitnesses, Peter, James, and John. In Galatians 2, 6 through 10, Paul says that he went to Peter, James, and John and confirmed the gospel message he was preaching, and that they basically gave their stamp of approval on his preaching. So if Paul thought that Jesus was God, and Paul basically fact-checked his gospel message with these key eyewitnesses, it's hard to imagine that Paul would have left out the part where he thought that Jesus was God. And if Paul didn't leave that out, if Paul did tell them that he was preaching that Jesus was God, um, it's hard to imagine that they would approve his gospel message if they didn't agree with him on that important point. And so um, basically what Paul preaches about Jesus does have a connection to these eyewitnesses. It doesn't mean that everything that Paul says agrees 100% with these eyewitnesses, but it does mean that um, Paul's not necessarily in a vacuum preaching stuff with no connection to the eyewitnesses. And so uh, knowing what Paul believed about Jesus and whether or not Jesus was God is very important for getting back to what the very earliest disciples believed about Jesus. All right, so this is the passage. Let's just start by reading it, and then I'll point out some important uh, parts of it. So it says, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not, rec did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant or slave, um, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, there are a lot of different important parts of this passage that are heavily debated. Specifically, what does the word form mean when it says he existed in the form of God? And second of all, what does the word a thing to be grasped mean? Um, it, it's debated whether or not that means something to be held on to that you already possess, or if it's talking about something you don't possess that you're reaching for and trying to grasp, or whether it can mean both. Um, another thing that is heavily debated is the ending part where it says, so that uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And this points back to the Old Testament, which um, applies this description to Yahweh, saying that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Yahweh is Lord. And so uh, by applying this to Jesus, some people say that uh, Paul is identifying Jesus as Yahweh whereas other people would argue that he's not. Another important debated part of this passage is that some people say this passage was an early Christian hymn that Paul is quoting. And they say this because it's written in a very 
a poetic way using parallelism and because it uses a lot of words that Paul doesn't usually use. Um, however, this is heavily debated and it's a little bit irrelevant to the topic at hand because whether or not Paul wrote this, he's still using it, which means that he believes it. And so if we're trying to figure out what does Paul believe, it's a little bit irrelevant as to whether or not Paul wrote it. And so we're not going to be dealing with all of these heavily debated aspects. We're just going to focus on the second Adam Christology. So does this teach that Jesus existed as God before his human birth or not? And people who say no often say that this is actually uh, this passage is parallel to Genesis and that Paul is pointing back to Genesis. So let's take a look at these parallels with Genesis. So uh, he existed in the form of God. They would say that the form of God is similar to image of God. And so when it says that uh, Jesus existed in the form of God, it's saying that he, like Adam, was made in the image of God. Um. And then when it says equality with God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. They would point to uh, the serpent saying to Eve, you will be like God, aka equal to God. And then she took, aka she grasped the fruit in order to try to be like God or equal to God. Also, we see the word likeness and being made in the likeness of men, which is very similar to when God says, let, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so the idea is that Paul is teaching that Jesus is a second form of Adam, not literally Adam, the same person, but that he had the same situation as Adam, but he uh, made an opposite choice. So uh, Jesus, like Adam, was made in the image of God. However, instead of trying to take or seize equality with God like Adam did, um, he humbled himself and therefore he was exalted. Whereas Adam tried to seize equality with God and instead of um, being exalted, he was humiliated and kicked out of the garden. So it's kind of like an opposite situation going on and Jesus made the right choice and so Christians are all supposed to have the same attitude that Christ had, where we're not trying to make ourselves like God, but rather trying to humble ourselves, and therefore we will be exalted. Um, and so that's basically the view that, that this is not teaching that Jesus was preexistent, but that that is missing the point. Um, all right, let's uh, keep going. So it's important to realize that Paul really does use Second Adam Christology a couple of other times throughout his letters. So, for example, in Romans uh, 5, 12 through 15, I didn't actually paste the entire passage here, but this will kind of give you a glimpse of how Paul uses Second Adam Christology. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all mankind because all sinned, um, and then skipping to uh, verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the violation committed by Adam, who is a, who is a type of him who was to come. So Paul is using a um, early form of Christian interpretation called typology, in which um, New Testament writers uh, point back to Old Testament characters and say that they are types of Jesus. Not that they weren't uh, literally existing, but rather that uh, something that they did paralleled the life of Jesus in some way. So Paul says that Adam is a type of Jesus. Um, and so if you keep going, it says, for if the offense um, of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. So Paul really does use in a second Adam Christology to talk about Jesus. Uh, you see this also in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, and 45. So it says, For since by a man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And then skipping to verse 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last Adam was a life-giving spirit. And here 
um, he calls Jesus the last Adam. And that's where we kind of get the idea of the second Adam. So Paul clearly does commonly contrast Jesus with um, Adam, calling Jesus the last Adam. And so basically proponents of the second Adam view often say that um, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is doing the same thing. All right. Now, if this were the case, um, we would naturally expect there to be verbal parallels. So now I'm getting into why I don't think that Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is um, second Adam Christology, because Paul has so many perfect opportunities to have verbal parallels that point the reader back to Genesis, but he doesn't take advantage of those where he easily could. And I think that Paul, when Paul does things like uh, appealing to the Old Testament, he's not, he doesn't try, try to be super cryptic. He is usually very clear and he wants his readers to get his point. And so, and so he would, if he had the easy opportunity to um, actually, actually use the wording from the Old Testament, he would do so. Now, Paul and his readers used something called the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so even though the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, um, um, they used a Greek version, which um, was the language that Paul wrote Philippians in. And so um, it would be possible for him to use the same words. It's not like Paul is translating Hebrew. And so using different, it's not like he's required to use different words. Uh, he is using the Greek Septuagint. And so he could easily use the same words, but he chooses not to. So for example, um, the word existed, he existed as huparko, and in the form of God, morphe. Now, I think that this is very important because Paul doesn't use the word for image of God. The word for image is akon, and he doesn't use the word for likeness of God, homoiosis. Instead, he uses the word form, morphe, uh, uh, morphe which is a different word. And there's no reason why he had to use that word. He could have easily used the word image of God. And he was very familiar with this word. It would, you know, it, it would be very strange for a, a uh, Christian to go around saying that he was made in the form of God rather than the image of God. Image of God is a common expression that we use in English. Form of God isn't. So since Paul doesn't take this opportunity, it sounds like he is not um, meaning the word form as image there. Likewise, it says, he did not regard equality with God, and he uses the word esos. This is a different word from uh, the word meaning like God, being like God in Genesis, which is the word hos. So um, th those words are different. And then when it says um, he did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped, something to be grasped is harpagmos which is a different word um, that, than the word that is used when Eve took the fruit, lombano. Uh, Paul could have easily used the word took. He didn't regard equality with God, something for him to take, but, but Paul doesn't use that word. He, he doesn't use a verbal parallel where he easily has the opportunity there. Then we get to the one word that you would think is a verbal parallel, likeness, being made in the likeness of men, which sounds similar in English to God made man according to our likeness, or yeah, according to our likeness. So there are a couple problems with this. Number one, it is not the likeness of God that Jesus is made in, but the likeness of men. So even if this is meant to parallel Genesis, it would be reversed. Instead of man being made in the likeness of God, it would be someone who's in the form of God being made in the likeness of man. And so it would still teach that Jesus was pre-existent um, and he existed in the form of God before his human birth, it would still teach that even if this is a parallel to Genesis, but actually it's not the same Greek word. So the word likeness in Paul is homoioma, homoioma, um, whereas in Genesis it's homoiosis. Now these are just two words apart in Strong's Concordance. They're very similar words, but it begs the question, if Paul is going to use such a similar word, why not just use the same word? Um, the same word as Genesis, if that's what he's actually pointing to.
and, and like I said, uh, even if he were pointing to Genesis, it wouldn't actually show that Paul does not believe that Jesus is God. Um, and then it says, being found in appearance as a man, schema. Here's another word where he has the opportunity to say being made in the likeness or the image um, of a man, but he uses a different word, schema. So in my opinion, the lack of verbal parallels with Genesis um, is kind of like, uh, you know, a, a strong reason for thinking that Paul is not appealing to Genesis because he has so many perfect opportunities to create verbal parallels but he doesn't do so. Um, when other Christian writers, here, let me see if I can move me out of the way. Okay. When other Jewish and Christian writers follow the Septuagint when talking about the image of God, they do use the same wording. So for example, uh, Philo was a um, Jew who wrote in Greek like Paul and who is actually a contemporary of Paul. And he wrote a book called On Creation, and I looked through that book, and every time he says the image of God, which is seven times, he always uses the wording from the Septuagint, the word acone. Um, likewise, Clement of Alexandria uses that phrase multiple times following the Septuagint. Eusebius of Caesarea uses it um, following the Septuagint. And I'm sure that many other Christian writers use it, but I didn't actually go through every single Christian writer to check whether or not they use that phrase. But the point is, image of God was a common expression, just like in English, image of God is a uh, expression. It would be weird to say, um, it, it would be very weird if a pastor were in church and he said, I am made in the form of God. People would be like, whoa, and um, probably start calling him a heretic. Instead, he would say, I'm made in the image of God, because then people know, oh, he's pointing back to Genesis. If Paul was not meaning to say that Jesus was God, you would think he would be clear by just using the Genesis word and calling um, him the image of God instead of using the word form of God, which would definitely verge on um, heresy if that's not what he was intending to say. We know that Paul um, is perfectly capable of saying the image of God and because he says it multiple other times in his um, uncontested epistles in 1 Corinthians 11, 7 and 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he uses the phrase image of God using the Septuagint wording, acon. And so it's unclear why he would avoid using it here if that's what he were trying to say. Um, and like I said, with the analogy with English, it would be very strange for someone to use a, a phrase other than image when talking about the image of God. And so I think that that's a strong case that Paul uh, does not mean image of God when he says that Jesus was made in the form of God. Um, second of all, Paul always uses, or Paul is always clear when using second Adam Christology. So Paul doesn't just kind of hint at it and just leave it for his reader to figure out. At first, it's a little bit vague. So for example, he says, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Um, that might be a little bit vague, um, but then he, he straight up makes it clear. He says, um, Adam, who, the violation committed by Adam, who is a type of him who has to come. He clearly points back to Adam, making a strong comparison because he wants his readers to understand what he's saying. He doesn't want it to be vague. Um, um, likewise, he does this the other time he does the uh, second Adam Christology in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 and 45. He says, for since by a man death came, by a man also the resurrection of the dead came. Now that might be a little bit unclear, um, but then he says, as in Adam all dies, so in Christ all will be made alive. He explains it the very next verse because he wants it to be very clear. He wants his readers to understand the connections he's drawing. He doesn't want there to be confusion. Likewise, in verse 45, he says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last man, Adam, was a life-giving spirit. Now, again, he points to Adam, and he explains it using the phrase Adam, and he, uh, he gives a direct quote from the Septuagint here. And it's clear it's the Septuagint. You can compare the Septuagint side by side. Um, it's clearly the Septuagint. Paul is using the Septuagint, and he actually quotes it verbatim. So, what would Philippians 2 look like if Paul did take advantage of these easy parallels? And if he 
um, talked about the uh, second Adam Christology in the same way that he does in other passages. It would look something like this. Have this, <clears throat> have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the image of God, did not regard the possibility of being like God, because the serpent says, you'll be like God. Instead of equality, he would have said, did not regard the possibility of being like God, something to take, something for him to take, because that's the word that um, it uses for Eve taking the fruit. Unlike Adam, who tried to take what was not his by becoming like God. And so he would have the clarification um, that he's talking about Adam there. Um, and so this is probably what it would look like if Paul were using a second Adam Christology, because it has none of these clear parallels, it's hard to take it as a second Adam Christology. So my conclusion is that there are no verbal parallels where there uh, was the perfect opportunity for them. Image of God was a common expression taken from the Septuagint that would be very strange to change, and it would definitely he, he could naturally expect it would confuse his readers if he was using the word form of God instead of image of God. And also, Paul always clearly alludes to Genesis, to the Genesis narrative when using Second Adam Christology. He always mentions Adam and makes it clear. He doesn't leave it ambiguous for his readers uh, to try to figure out. Remember, in the book of Philippians, Paul has not given any Second Adam Christology already, and so it would be kind of weird to just unload this very elaborate second Adam Christology, leaving out all verbal parallels and all references to Adam or Genesis. Um, so does Paul think that Jesus is God? I think that this passage that we've been discussing shows that, it, that he does, but there's another place where Paul clearly shows that he believes Jesus is God, and he does have verbal parallels to the Septuagint. Um, and it comes from 1 Corinthians 8, 6, which refers to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, 4, which is known as the Shema. The Shema is possibly the most important passage for Jews during the time that Paul is writing. Um, they, they, they have this memorized and they would use this as kind of their statement for monotheism, uh, for why they rejected other gods. And so Deuteronomy says, here, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. This was a very famous um, quotation from the Old Testament that Jews would have known in Paul's day. But Paul takes it and he slaps Jesus right into the middle of it. He says, yet for us, and the word who men there um, is very close to the word who moan, um, the Lord our, which in Greek is uh, the Lord is the God of us. And in Corinthians, he says, there is only one God for us. So it's a very similar wording there that Paul started using um, first person plural there. It shows that he is, um, it shows that it is a parallel with Deuteronomy 6, 4. And then he says, there is only one God, using the Greek words, heis theos, the father from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, and he says, heis Curios, one Lord, Jesus Christ. And so he takes the, the one God and the one Lord, and he says there's one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. So he puts Jesus into the middle of the Shema. And interestingly, the word Lord there, uh, what he's quoting from the Septuagint, the word Lord, was the Septuagint's way of translating the word Yahweh. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh. So what Paul is doing here is he's basically calling Jesus Christ Yahweh. Um, and so interestingly, Paul is identifying Jesus Christ as being inside of the divine sphere of Yahweh, but at the same time, he's quoting a passage known for emphasizing Jewish monotheism. And so Paul is taking Jesus, calling him God, and at the same time, emphasizing that there is only one God. And so he's putting Jesus inside of the divine sphere of Yahweh, as Richard Bauckham uh, would have termed it, putting Jesus inside of the divine sphere. And so it's clear from this passage uh, that there are three verbal allusions to the Old Testament um, that show that Paul did believe that Jesus was God. Thanks so much for watching the video. Um, be sure to subscribe if you want more content like this, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.